everybody. I have a word that um, is very serious, and we're just going to get right to it. Okay? Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the privilege and the honor of being able to do this, God. Declare your glory and bring glory to your name, Lord. And I pray, God, that you be with me in this message. I know that you've prepared it. I know it's from you. And I pray that none of my own words would be heard, God, but only your own. Only your words, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And before I do that, let me give a little backstory here. Uh, yesterday in church, we hit on some pretty um, good worship songs. I truly believe that when we are in worship, that is where God can come and really churn and move and um, get to the, get to the, I don't know, to the crux of stuff in your heart, in my heart. If we are worshiping in spirit and truth as the Bible instructs us, then uh, when we enter into a worship service, it doesn't matter the performance of the songs. It could matter to the songs that are sung, but they need to matter in the context of God giving the worship leader those songs rather than he or she picking them out for themselves based upon just what they want to sing or what they want to hear. So the songs should be given by God, should be led to the leader by the Lord, and that comes out of prayer and um asking God what what does he want to say this morning where where is his message in the worship and so when when worship service has been entrusted to someone who does that then therefore the songs that come forth um God wants to use and he will use especially if prayer's been put in to seek out what those songs are. In other words, a worship service could be done, an entire worship service could be done on one song. We don't need three songs and a, and a, and a catch up. I, I, you know, I mean, an anchor song. We, we, we could only do an entire worship service on one song. And that is because God has a plan and we need to be submitted to his plan when we come in there. But yesterday we had some real good cut to the heart worship songs that brought forth quite a lot of um, meat, message, okay? And the first one was this. It was called Run to the Father. And here are the words of it. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. There was an immediate door open. The Lord was talking to people. The Lord was speaking. Yes, the Lord speaks. Not in the... Um, exact terminology as one might think and then therefore be critical of. No, the Lord speaks. The Lord speaks when you open up his Bible, his word. The Lord speaks through a worship song. The Lord speaks through other people who become obedient into the thoughts and whatnot that are falling into their heart. And when they are mature in hearing those things, they know that they know that it's from God. And so therefore they choose by, by, um, the fact that they've honed this skill, that they've studied with the Lord, that they know, um, that it's, uh, uh, they know it's God's voice. It's not that they hear voices. 
It's that they have revelation to the fact that the thoughts or the sensing that they're having is God's voice. And so then they bring forth that word. Why? To edify and build up others. That's clearly what the Bible states. To edify and build up others. Sometimes it can come in the form of a correction. But that correction would always need to lean towards the side of building up others and edifying others and lifting them up in the ways of the Lord. Not to knock them down, be critical of them. To There is no condemnation that God would bring forth in somebody speaking what they think God is saying to them as a word that comes out. Okay? So yesterday, this song began to play. And there's many people that the Lord speaks through in my church, and I'm one of them, okay? It can be all, but maybe some people haven't um, become secure in that. Maybe some people haven't learned exactly what that means yet. But anyway, um, I am one of those people that move in that gift, and I knew that God was, may I loosely say, he was poking, yeah? He was, he was coming at some people. And I heard that chorus again. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. And that song right there in a state of worship established a platform of surrender to where the Lord wanted his people to understand that when you surrender, when you see that you need me, then I can become that heart surgeon that is needed in your situation to allow you to see and know and be healed from all that uh, plagues your heart. We were sinners until we came to Jesus Christ. Our, our sin is still there per se, but when we come to Jesus, his blood covers our sin. And now we get a new slate, all right? We still did those things that we did. We still thought those things that we thought. We still participated in those things that we participated in. But that sin has been forgiven. Why? Because of Jesus' blood that he shed on the cross. And when we believe in that and we surrender to it, then he covers that sin. How do we get there? How does a person who has never been explained this before, per se, doesn't know how to walk in it yet, how do they get there? They know they have problems. They know, they, they, maybe even they come to the conclusion that they know they need something. Somewhere. They don't know that what they're needing is actually Jesus yet, but they know they need something. Somewhere. What causes them to understand and know that they need Jesus? And I'm gonna try my hardest to go there today. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The word of God. In John, it says that the word, Jesus was the word made flesh. This right here is obviously the word of God in print. But it also is In its entirety, Jesus teaching us about Jesus, the prophecy of Jesus coming in the Old Testament. Then Jesus comes in the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus, what Jesus has done for us. And in Hebrews, it says here that 
The word of God is living and powerful. Jesus is alive because he rose from the dead after three days being crucified. He's alive and brought power in that resurrection. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in us if we have given our hearts to him. Sharper than any two-edged sword, when a sword goes into flesh, it cuts both top and bottom. And what this scripture right here is telling us, that the power that the word has, Jesus, reading the word, having relationship with him, is so powerful like a two-edged sword, it cuts through. Nothing else can do that to make us see clearly, to give us understanding. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Our soul is our mind, will, and our emotions. And our spirit is the is what's created by God to where he comes and lives when we surrender ourselves to him. He comes and lives in that spirit man that we have. We are a spirit. We have a soul. And we live in a body. We are a tripart being. And of joints and marrow. The best way I know how to, to how to explain that, and forgive me for the crudeness, but when you're cutting a chicken, and I know how to cut a whole chicken, when you're cutting a chicken and you, you have to stick that knife right at the joint, but you have to stick it on the other side of the joint in order to get through the marrow. And that's what that's talking about, that precise cut. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is the discerner. It's the discernment because Jesus gives us the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who brings revelation to our mind that sinks down to our heart and lets us see things in a different way. Gives us new eyes to see with. So the word made flesh is Jesus and this is saying the word of God is all these things Jesus coming into our spirit man when we surrender ourselves to him and give us everything give him everything that we are becomes the heart surgeon of our being mm. <clears throat> here we learn that the power of scripture to perform surgery where true change begins in the invisible, immaterial heart. It is divine in its very words. God is revealed as the one who speaks. When you pick up this, you're listening to God's voice. When you read this, God is going inside your being, inside your heart, your heart man, your spirit man, and it is affecting you because it's alive and it's powerful and able to do all these things in a supernatural way, not in the natural as we understand. You got it? We have to get this thing out of our minds that we're going to be able to understand how God works. That we're going to be able to figure it out. We can't figure it out. We don't operate on the same level that God does. His word. We don't operate on the same level that his word does. Since the Bible is a divine book, it speaks with divine authority. The scriptures are able to transform the inner person because the scriptures are alive. When, when the word of God, which is living and powerful, Jesus, comes into our lives, he is able to transform us, to give us a new mind, to give us new eyes to see with. He's able to do that, but first we have to surrender. Just as if you saw my post in the word because this is where I'm going the word came yesterday in that service and I came forth and gave this word because it was the word of God so he's speaking he used me he could have used anybody it's not about the fact that he used me he could have used anybody anybody that wanted to be obedient 
But he used me and I followed through and was obedient. And I gave this word as a heart surgeon has to have the surrender of the patient before they do any kind of surgery on our hearts. God wants to be our heart surgeon, but we must surrender to him first. As this song was saying, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. I need help, Lord. I got to have some help on this heart of mine. I need a heart surgeon. I got to, I'm going to let you, I choose to let you get in there and root around God and give me healing in the areas of my heart that need to have healing. Why? How? Because the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. The word living from the Greek verb means to live. It can be translated constantly, actively alive. The word of God is not just a book that's been written by a bunch of men. No, the word of God is a book that was written by a bunch of men by the divine power coming from God through them to write it down. This is alive and powerful working through the divine authority of God. There is no authority that's above this. And in that it is able to do heart surgery on us. Because it is the voice of Jesus Christ, the living word, the Bible never rests. It's always working. It's always life-giving. It's able to save your soul. Active comes from the word which we get energy from. The Bible is productive. It's alive. It's actively doing things inside of us. When we get into the word of God and we haven't known Jesus before, let's just say this, and we're curious so that we're already, God's already working on our hearts. We wouldn't have these thoughts on our own. There, we can't get curious about the word of God without God working on us in some way first. We don't just do this on our own. It's always divine. It's a drawing that the Holy Spirit does. We don't just draw ourselves. Oh, I wonder what the Bible says about this. No, if we're wondering, then that means God's speaking to us. If we're wondering, that means God's working in our life. When scripture is employed for the work of any kind of counseling, it is like spiritual rain being poured on God's people. And the result is growth and fruitfulness. We cannot get into the word of God, allow him to be the heart surgeon that we surrendered ourselves to in the first place and not have it bring forth any kind of productivity or fruit out of our life. It's not possible. It will always bring productivity and fruit from the Lord out of our life. Are we going to be perfect in that? No, there's never anywhere where it says we're going to be perfect in that. We have to allow the Lord to work in that through us. But we have to reach this point of surrender first in order for us to get to that point. Scripture pierces the heart and our conscience. The adjective sharper originates from the root Temno, which means to cut. The word, God's word, Jesus Christ, has cutting power in our heart mind, in our spirit man. There's cutting power that goes on. Cut down to the truth. Cut down to the root of things. It is incisively penetrating. As a two-edged sword pierces through body parts, so the word of God pierces through the innermost person. The piercing words of God twist and turn to expose whatever is in our hearts so that we may repent. What does it mean to repent? Repent means you've gotten to the point where you have decided that you need a savior and 
you have reached that point of surrender. So now you're compelled to ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins because you believe that he's the only one that can forgive you of any of the sin that you've committed in your life. But that's not the full meaning of repent. Repent means to now change your mind from which it first was sitting or placed and go another way. So you're going to turn around, so to speak, and now you're going to walk with Jesus Christ. That is true repentance. I don't want to be like that anymore. I don't want to dwell on that past anymore. I don't want to sit in that spot anymore. I'm going to repent, which means I'm going to turn myself this way. I'm going to have a change of mind or I'm going to have a change of heart. Heart and mind in the Bible are very similar, almost the same. I'm going to have a change of heart. I'm going to allow God to be the surgeon in my heart. Pick it apart. Find the stuff that needs to be dealt with. Find the stuff that needs to be uncovered. Heal the diseases of my heart. Cover my sin. And now I'm going to change my direction and I'm going to walk with him. A true repentive heart produces fruit. It produces transformation. Only the way that God can give it. Not our own transformation. If we keep trying on it, we will, we will never get there. We have to give that up to God. The piercing words of God twist and turn to expose whatever is in our hearts so that we may repent. It is the scalpel used by the divine surgeon to expose cancerous sin. Oh, such a good explanation that must be dealt with in order to gain spiritual health. I've had cancer. Some of you listening might have had cancer. Some of you listening might have people and friends and family in your life that have cancer right now. I have that too. The only way to get cancer out of the area that it's in is to either remove it by cutting it out or radiation, chemotherapy, those things still remove it. They, they, they get it gone. The only way to do that is by the work of doctors and or surgeons. And that comparison right there, well, except for the fact that, of course, God can heal cancer too. And I've had that happen. They go, they went in and they removed mine and then God healed my body and withheld that cancer from coming back. So, God works with doctors. I truly believe that. It is still ultimately him that gives all of that goodness, all of that healing. But this is being compared. God is being compared in his word as the one who works like a scalpel by the divine surgeon that goes in and removes cancerous sin that must be dealt with in order to gain spiritual health. Therefore, we must let the word of God do its cutting and its healing work. Scripture analyzes and sifts through our inner being, exposing the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It's the only thing that can truly expose what is in our heart and what is in our mind. Nothing else in this world can do that. Nothing. Only God. It weighs out the reflections of our mind and the affections of our heart in order to show us what we truly worship and therefore what we truly serve. When this word came yesterday, I saw a picture of a heart surgeon cutting away at somebody's heart and immediately I was shown that in order for that to happen, that person had to surrender everything that they were over to the surgeon. They can't get into that position without 100% surrender of themselves. Meaning, they sign a consent form, they go into surgery, they go under anesthetic, and they allow that doctor to open up their heart. God wants to be our heart surgeon. 
The result is somewhat like the prodigal son over in Luke 15. Because when he had to deal with his heart where he was in the lifestyle that he was living. And he knew that he had hit rock bottom. See the Holy Spirit was dealing with him there. And was showing him things that he didn't really want to see. And was revealing to him the things that he didn't really want to think about. It, it, the Holy Spirit came in like living and powerful like a two-edged sword and cut through that man's heart and said look at these things that you have done to your father and that prodigal son went home not knowing what he was going to get but he had been uh, humbled he had been humbled and he had been moved in his heart to where he took that action of going home so he first surrendered to the drawing and the and the pulling of the holy spirit and trying to show him what needed to be done in his heart he asked for forgiveness therefore humbling him even lower to the point where he was led to go home and face his father when his father saw him he was not standing there going well it's about time you came home it's about time I told you that, you know, you were going to get to this point. And boy, I'm glad. Now go be with your brother, the one that's done me well. No, his father didn't say anything like that. No, his father set all of that aside and did what? Greeted him with open arms and was running towards him as the story goes. And that is a depiction of how God greets us when we have laid everything down and come into that place of full 100% surrender no longer relying on ourselves to get that job done no longer relying on our own thoughts and our own ways we have surrendered over to the greatest heart surgeon there can be and we've allowed him to go in and find even the tiniest tiniest spot at the end of whatever vein or electrode or artery that there is the tiniest spot and we said god i give you full permission to go in there and dig that out lord forgive me of this and forgive me of that let let it be that you would cover all of my diseases in my heart in my mind with your blood god i want to walk in a different way now and when we do that God is standing there going, oh child, I was waiting for this. Because maybe you're one that turned your back on God and now you've come to this point. Maybe you're one that says, well, I go to church every Sunday, Rhonda. I, I'm fine as far as, really? Now be careful, am I really? What I mean by that is, is it's a, it's a, uh, a daily like the Bible says, dying to self. We lay ourselves down and we're allowing God to always, always, always get into our heart, such as David did in the Psalms. Get into our heart and, and show us where there is a wicked way. You could be one that's turned your back on God and now the result is going to be kind of like the prodigal son where he's got his arms open wide. But still, it could be one that... You know, you haven't turned your back on God, but you've been denying him these areas in your life, maybe. You've been denying him these areas in your heart, and he wants to get in there and do that surgery that needs to be done. But you have to surrender. You have to be one that surrenders to the heart surgeon. A doctor can't get in there and work unless 100% surrender by the patient. That surrender is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now we've faced the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We've allowed the conviction of the Holy Spirit to come by the power that the Word gives us. We learn in Hebrews 4. And the power that the Word has in our hearts and our minds and our soul and our spirit. And we've allowed Him to perform the surgery that we said, I'm going to run to you again and again and again for. This is how worship intertwines itself into the truth of God's word and where we should be in worship when, when we're in worship in church. Allowing the Lord's word to convict us and move in our hearts while we're singing the songs, while we're listening to the words and allowing him to pour into us what he wants to say. So we go from conviction to surrender 
then when we allow him to do the work that needs to be done, when we allow him to hold the scalpel and really get into our heart and do what needs to be done, we move into praise. And then we sit in his presence and we just love on him. That's the key. That right there is the process. In fact, I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to be bold enough to say this. That's all you need to know. That will right there, that, that, that process of going through, that will compel you to stay in his word. That will propel you to serve him in good works. That, not that it earns you your salvation, but that it, that it pleases the Lord. And whatever pleases him, when you strive to please him, then the love for him grows deeper inside your heart. Understand that conviction of sin is an expression of God's mercy. It leads to forgiveness, which leads to freedom. I want to pray for you. If you've never received the Lord as your Savior, I'm going to pray for you first. And then I want to pray for people who do know God, but perhaps they've never heard maybe a message like this before, or they're very convicted right now in their own life as far as letting him be that heart surgeon every day, all the time. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, bow your head with me right now and just say these words in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I need you, God. I believe in you. I believe you are the only one that can cover my sin. God, I'm so sorry for my sin in my life. I'm so sorry, Lord. I want to live for you now. Yes, God, be the heart surgeon that I need. And now I want to turn my way towards you and walk in repentance. God, come into my soul and my spirit and fill me, Lord. Teach me how to walk in your way. Thank you, God, for being my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. And those of you who know the Lord, I want to pray over you right now. Father, I pray that there was ears to hear, God, that there was ears to hear in the people that you had tuned into this and that they heard that maybe they aren't attentive enough to your hands working in their hearts as the heart surgeon that you are, God. I pray that there would be new revelation on their minds and their hearts, that they would understand how important your word is how powerful your word is and what it can do and how it can heal every inch, every area. God, I pray that you would uh, unveil areas in their hearts that they need to see, Lord. I pray that you would expose in their lives, Lord God, stuff that they need to see. I pray that as conviction comes in, it doesn't rid them with guilt or shame. I come against guilt or shame in the name of Jesus. And I pray that conviction leads them to freedom, Lord. Freedom that can only be found in you, God. I pray this over your people that were willing to hear your voice today, Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, I pray that even the smallest seed of this message goes deep, deep, deep into the prepared soil of your heart and it plants itself and brings forth life and life abundant. May the Lord bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you.